Oliver Legrand, sculptor, poet, teacher, humanitarian. In 1973, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Harrisburg established a scholarship fund honoring both the man and his contributions to spiritual awareness. Scholarship recipients may elect to participate in the mentor program, which is designed to provide assistance and support in a variety of ways. Born in 1906 in Oklahoma, Legrone grew up amid violence and injustice against African Americans, but with the strength and determination of his minister father and the sympathetic support of his mother. He credited his father's strong faith as the catalyst for his own unshakable optimism, which was evident to all those who heard him speak. As a child, his first artistic efforts, formed from the raw red clay of Oklahoma, were met with approval and encouragement by his parents. As a mature artist, Legrone spoke of the role of the artist as an intuitor of nature and its communicator. He said that while all of us possess antennae which reach out to experience the sensuality of the world, an artist might feel those things with greater intensity or might be predisposed to carry on a kind of transmigration of himself into an empathy with nature, a feeling that he must tell it, he must record it, the thing itself talks to him. This theme is reflected in these lines from Legrone's poem, Time Walker. Earthbound, my feet yet stride the plans of the universe, matching no more, no less, the role of nature's cycles. And from those steps I see, time's essence is of life. And life is price for time to weave the carpet walkway from thens and now to whens. The following excerpts are from a 1989 interview with Oliver Legrone. So I think I'll put that question to you. How did you begin with your art form? Really, Alan, it was a very elemental thing. It was a case of my senses getting sort of tied up with that red Oklahoma clay in the early spring when they had those April showers, you know. And that clay in Oklahoma is red and about the best thing for modeling, mm. and I presume for firing too, old I've never fired any of it, that you could get. Well, in the early spring when those showers would come down, I'd get me a big bundle of it. I was four years old uh, at the time, and I put a lot of it in my shirt tail and took it back on our back porch and started modeling a portrait, really, of a man who had become a hero of ours. Frederick Douglass. My father told me the tale of this young man, his escape from slavery and whatnot, and mm -hmm. uh, so he was a hero of mine. And I did this uh, study and had the good fortune to have both parents praise me for the work when I thought I was right on the brink of getting a little reprimand at least, uh, <laughs> because I was covered from head to foot with that great clay. <laughs> and uh, they praised me. And uh, so it gave me a little start off. And of course, over a period of years, it has made me feel that really the things that youngsters do creatively in art that way, if the teachers can find it with any hearts to praise some things that sometimes don't make sense to them, mm -hmm. old scrawls and whatnot on paper and uh, that sort of thing, if they can praise it, they can turn that child on to education and make it so that education is really a pleasant experience, a creative experience. Mm -hmm. And I certainly believe that applies in uh, art generally and uh, the creative fields. And when, of course, I say that art that way, I mean all of the collective areas of art. True. Because it's so important to have that parental encouragement at the beginning. That's what it takes, yes. yes. That's where it all gets started. And I, I look back upon those times and say how fortunate I was that that happened to me. Well, Oliver, you know, I noticed by uh, watching your latest show that you have a number of black portraits in your um, exhibition. Um, many, many artists that I notice nowadays are really going to the abstract, whether it's in sculpture or art or, or jazz or whatever. And you've chosen to retain that theme. Can you tell me the significance of that? Well, I tell you what. I am perhaps leaning a little bit more now toward uh, some abstract works, but I have been faced with this, with the need of saying something about the black presence in America. Since the coins and all of the icons, generally speaking, have uh, told about uh, the people who were the great uh, uh, figures of leadership uh, that were white in this country, and it has resulted in 
really the blacks themselves not having a sufficient knowledge about who their who their great people were and the significance of the black presence within the total of American history. Mm -hmm. So I felt that one way to perhaps touch slightly the psyche, the consciousness of America, was to do some of these and let them see that. Just as every piece of coin and, and legal tender that we have, have has, of course, the black, the white heroes, why they need to, we need to have a chance to see this black presence so that the blacks themselves will know of their beauty. Mm -hmm. Because really the nature of what they have contributed to American society, for instance, try to think what it would be <laughs> like without the morality that it was produced by people like, well, let's say Martin Luther King, uh, George Washington Carver, James Weldon Johnson, uh, and uh, Frederick Douglass, and uh, Harriet Tubman. What would our moral consciousness be without the role of these people? Sure, they had the help of many, many whites of goodwill. But I thought I'd like to say something about that, and uh, I'm, uh, I don't mind uh, working with this, and I admire those who feel that uh, a bent piece of metal out on a big lawn is the greatest type of sculpture mm -hmm. that ever was, but I don't feel that I should, it, it should be an objectionable thing in terms of my art that I'm, I speak about the black presence in terms of the features, the characteristics, and the story that time and experience that has been peculiar to black people has written upon their faces. You mentioned before that you uh, like to teach, so I'm going to try to put you on the spot one last time. And if you had some advice to offer to all those young, aspiring artists out there, what would it be? Well, first of all, I would ask them to remember that the fraternity of creative artists is a long time and a large, large number of peoples among all of the cultures of the world. So when you participate that way, you are not only exploiting yourself and growing, but you are actually joining this great fraternity. So you can join hands if that gives you a sense of pleasure in feeling that you're one of that great group of people who have come to recognize there's no business like show business, because that's what artists are. They are people who are exhibitionists, who have managed to channel their creative energies into ways that, uh, well, that reaffirm man's faith in things that are not necessary material. Mm -hmm. And uh, it teaches that fundamental spiritual lesson that man does not live by bread alone, and that man is fundamentally a scratcher of the earth from that he makes all that there is. And some of his most memorable creations are those that final, find formal, final form in beauty and in a sense of man's spiritual worth. Excellent. Thank yes. you. Thank you. It's been nice to be here. We have had the rare opportunity to speak with and learn the insights of one of America's living cultural legends, Oliver Legron. Does an old man call the Mississippi? That's the old man I don't want to be. What does he carry if the land got Oliver Legron passed away in 1995, leaving a legacy of art, poetry, education, humanitarianism, and commitment to ideas. <laughs>